Hi, I'm Salim. I've been involved. Oops, wrong title. There we go. I've been involved with Clang and LLVM for quite a few years, focused on ARM across Linux and Windows. More recently, I've been focused on Swift and bringing it to Windows. I'm hoping to highlight some of the interesting problems I encountered on that journey today. I think that many people would be interested in the motivation, so I'll start there. Swift is designed for safety, preventing uninitialized variables, providing overflow checking, and automated memory management through ARC, or automatic reference counting. It is a language that is useful beyond just iOS, capable of scaling from embedded systems to the web. As an example, Swift Web UI provides a declarative framework for web content, similar to how Apple's Swift UI does so for applications. The language supports procedural, object-oriented, generic, and protocol-oriented programming, while retaining aspects of functional programming. This allows you to select the appropriate approach for the problem. Designed to be compiled to native code via LLVM, Swift can achieve near-C performance. The static type system allows better semantic analysis, enabling stronger validation and performance guarantees. Furthermore, it opens the possibilities for more advanced optimizations, such as devirtualization. Not having any large pre-existing code bases to support, it can provide a unified, coherent surface for development without compatibility implications. It provides powerful generics and inline closures, which enable a concise way to describe callbacks and supports transparent FFI to other languages. Although unlike C++, where you pay for what you use, the general overheads are low, and there are many escape patches built into the language. Swift's position in the design space gives it an opportunity to possibly replace C for modern, low-level systems development. Bringing a code base designed for Unix to a non-Unix environment is challenging. So why spend the time and energy on this? Windows controls over 75% of the consumer market. This comes with an extensive developed population that now has access to this language. Swift has been created with the experiences of designing a platform for rapid development of a spectrum of applications, from productivity to immersive AR VR experiences, from gaming to health. This would bring these learnings to the developers on this platform. The compiled nature of Swift, the high level of abstraction, and escape hatches for direct access to memory provides a new option for writing the next generation of portable code for both systems and applications which can bridge the architecture and OS chasm. This port identifies hidden assumptions which exclude other platforms and exercises rarely executed code paths, improving the Swift and LLVM code bases. Incompatibilities are rather easy to insert, but are difficult to identify and resolve. There's the personal motivating factor as well. This is an interesting technical challenge. The problems span the technical gamut from parsing to object file encoding as well as the social aspect, finding solutions to problems which require buy-in from the rest of the community of engineers working on the language. Porting Swift also involved porting the web of software that it is a part of, which together forms a developer experience. The Swift compiler is a C++ code base written, built with the learnings of building Clang, which is embedded in the Swift compiler to generate efficient FFI to other languages. The Swift runtime, written in C++, supports a standard library, written in Swift, which provides nearly all the core functionality, including the fundamental data types, such as integers and strings. LibDispatch, Foundation, and XCTest, collectively known as the core libraries, provide the basic facilities which developers expect of a modern development ecosystem. Debugging Swift relies on LDB. Rudimentary support for Windows and LDB came much later forcing most of the debugging to be done through disassembly. Swift has tooling to support the IDE experiences expected of modern systems through SourceKit LSP for semantic code completion and Swift Package Manager for dependency management. There is demand for Swift on Windows from the community, but porting Swift to Windows has technical challenges of breadth and depth. It requires knowledge of the Windows subsystems and tools, including the ABI object file format, module loading, linking, and the toolchain. The mirroring aspects in Darwin need to be understood in order to port functionality. 
There have been a few notable previous attempts. Previous ports had attempted to use Sigmin, a POSIX emulation environment for Windows, and MinGW, a development tool which provides a minimal GNU environment for Windows. Both of these, however, require packaging additional dependencies with the compiler and the generated applications, and try to hide the Windows APIs. When Microsoft announced the Windows subsystem for Linux, people tried to use the Ubuntu builds on Windows via WSL. Although this functioned, it was slower due to the overheads of the emulation of the system calls. More importantly, it isolated Swift from Windows due to the way that WSL functioned. In my opinion, this port has been the most thorough. It's set out in a different direction, bringing Swift to Windows as a native tool. The desire was to port the software to Windows, relying on system libraries wherever possible. I wanted to bridge to the system libraries, bring the Windows APIs to developers in Swift, something which the previous ports had not successfully completed. While LLVM had standardized on CMake, Swift had no such thing, which proved to be a challenge on Windows. The LLVM projects moved to CMake some years ago. CMake allows cross-compilation and supports multiple platforms, though it brings its own challenges. Because it is designed for use on different platforms, it is not reliant on Unix-only tools, but those dependencies do get introduced accidentally. Swift also used CMake to drive its build, at least for the compiler, runtime, and the standard library. LibDispatch, however, was built using AutoTools. The AutoTools suite is great for Unix, as it simplifies cross-compilation and porting of software, but it has the problem that it is inherently tied to that Unix heritage. In order to be able to build on Windows, LibDispatch would need to switch to CMake. A separate build system would diverge quickly. One of the major difficulties of moving to a new build system was trying to create a perfect replica of the existing build. The other core libraries relied on custom tooling to build and took no attempts to abstract out the details of the underlying system. They assumed that the build and host environments would be similar and have Unix tools at their disposal. To orchestrate the various invocations needed to build subprojects, Swift has a helper, BuildScript, which is an amalgamation of Python and Bash. This mixture does not readily run on Windows, and before we could even start to build anything, we had to disentangle the subbuilds and orchestrate them through a separate mechanism. The Windows environment is significantly different from the traditional Unix environment. The tools that we are used to, like Bash and Make, are unavailable. To complicate things further, Make is designed to be used with traditional Unix tools, which are not available on Windows. The Windows command line is archaic compared to what is available on Linux. The file system on Linux or on Windows is slower than on Linux, increasing build times. This is exacerbated by the fact that Swift builds multiple large subprojects like LLVM and Clang. In order to both improve developer productivity, and honestly, for my own comfort, I decided to terraform the development environment. By using cross-compilation techniques, I could continue to use Linux for the majority of the development. Because it worked within the structure that the project had at the time, it made it easier to get the patches merged. It would also allow for some parallel efforts, allowing me to focus on the code generation aspects earlier, while the rest of the system was conditioned to be brought over to the alien land. In order to build Swift, we need a toolchain capable of building it on Windows, notably a compiler, assembler, and linker. LVM had most of the capabilities we needed. Clang can build code targeting Windows as long as the SDK content is available, and with Clang CL, CMake behaves as if we're building with MSVC. The SDK content is not case correct, which caused complications when cross-compiling on a case-sensitive file system. Fortunately, Clang has a tool in its arsenal which can address this. The VFS allows us to provide a mapping for the headers to correct the case without having to modify the SDK content. We have the LLVM integrated assembler which allows us to actually build object files. The Swift project doesn't really rely much on handwritten assembly outside of the tests, and some gentle guidance to the compiler will ensure that we see AT&T style assembly rather than Intel to reduce perturbation across the various targets. The golden BFD linkers, due to limited support for Microsoft's SDK and more advanced TLS features, were not immediately viable for this port. We could use Link on Windows, but not on Linux when cross-compiling. LLD at the time worked well, but did not support ARM64. Additionally, it was unable to generate import libraries, which are required to perform dynamic linking. While there were other ways forward, 
I decided that the best way forward was to add the missing functionality to LLD, which would also improve the tooling in LLVM. Another source of problems was the Windows SDK, which has incorrectly cased libraries. The case in sensitive environment on Windows hides this, but on Linux, this manifested as link time failures. While Clang has the ability to handle case incorrect headers, LD has no functionality to deal with incorrect library names. By automating the construction of a forest of symbolic links to provide the case corrected names, I could link on a case sensitive file system. Porting to a new platform brought along a new bootstrap toolchain into the Swift build. Despite standards, implementations diverge significantly. Under specification in the C++ standard leads to undefined and implementation defined behavior. This includes evaluation or order of arguments. Windows evaluates right to left rather than left to right. Generated IR would sometimes change order of operations and we would see differences in the generated code and tests. Other times, evaluation of a parameter would alter state. A subsequent call for the next parameter would now return a different value. Here, the class member owned pointer would be moved prior to the data access for the construction of the string ref, which would now attempt to access invalid memory. For the use after move, Clang Tidy provides a check which can ca catch this type of issue. The Swift runtime is written in C++, which is provided by the platform. There can be unexpected behavioral differences between different implementations. Stud Atomic has evolved over the years, with Visual Studio adhering more closely to C++17's rules and making it non-trivially constructible. This violated the assumption that the Swift object type, which uses Stud Atomic for reference counting, would be trivially constructible. Fortunately, some aggressive static asserts identified the issue before it became a runtime failure. One of the interesting choices Swift made is to expose the system libraries and then build upon them. There are different threading models, but Swift assumed POSIX threading and built primitives which had to be generalized to enable porting. New abstractions had to be introduced, and in some places, platform-specific behavior added to support Windows as threading. Where the core libraries bridge into the system, differences in the C library would sometimes appear. Windows has 10 nanosecond granularity on timers with libdispatch, and Win32-specific APIs for network interface enumeration with foundation required careful handling to match expectations. A difference most developers never have to consider is the object file format that the platform uses. ELF, MACO, PECOF, and soon VASM all have made different trade-offs resulting in interesting differences. MACO permits weak linking. ELF bit dash Z defs will pre prevent weak linking and PE-COF requires strong resolution of symbols. This sometimes manifested as failure to link due to underspecified link time dependencies. Since there is no sanctioned way for the user to access weak linking in Swift, and no easy way to currently emulate this on PE-COF, I simply disabled support for it. Weak linking also appeared in the auto-linking mechanism, a templated reference generated by the compiler to ensure that dependent libraries are linked. On pe cough environments, I ended up changing the weak references to strong references, which subtly changes semantics. Dependent libraries are required rather than optional. pe cough has the concept of DLL storage, explicit information on whether a symbol is available in the current module or not. Symbol visibility in ELF and MACO indicate whether or not a symbol participates in global resolution, but does not indicate locality. In C, C++, the developer explicitly specifies the DLL storage associated with the symbol. No such annotation exists in Swift, and the introduction of one would break source level compatibility. Swift's compilation model enables the inference of the locality of the symbol through module level visibility. To expedite the port, I special case the standard library, marking all the symbols outside the standard library as DLL import. Other libraries currently rely on the linker converting the imported symbols to local symbols. In Swift, the module serves as a translation unit with possible recompilation for source files as extensions are discovered. Because it is not always possible to tell a priori where a symbol may reside, some, such as default argument generators, are emitted multiply. Mako permits this. ELF only complains if you link with dash Z defs, but PE cough restricts this. Here, I change the IR gen to use VicoDR semantics, select any copy, 
but preserve exactly one definition. Link wants ODR semantics and LVMIR change to no longer create combat groups, instead requiring explicit combat construction. Elf and Mako would coalesce symbols due to weak linking, but PE Cough could not. The Swift IR gen had to be refactored to support the new semantics, identifying the various locations that a symbol could be emitted multiply as link once ODR and ensure that they would be associated with a combat group. Compatibility between compilers is built upon convention. The calling convention covers the way that arguments are passed, results returned, registers guaranteed to be saved, or which may be overwritten. It also covers the name decoration schemes, also known as name mangling on Unix, in languages where applicable. To support its language semantics, Swift defines a custom calling convention. For example, Swift does not support exceptions. Rather, the throw keyword is syntactic sugar for returning an error value. To speed up their error handling, Swift CC uses a designated error register. Swift's custom calling convention requires changes to Clang so that C, C++ can interoperate transparently with Swift. Calling convention participates in the C++ overloading for function parameters and template type specialization. As a new calling convention, Swift CC needed to be decorated into the function name in C++. Since this occurs in the C++ namespace, which is controlled by the system vendor, that is Microsoft, this could cause conflicts. Although Clang has added extensions to, C to the C++ name decoration scheme, by explicitly encoding underscore underscore Clang into the name, Microsoft was kind enough to help preserve the required space. Clang provides extended vector types, types designed to represent values for the SIMD registers on ISA such as Neon and Altebec, and their name decoration was not handled properly. The use of overloading on extended vector types in the Swift runtime helped improve Clang's handling of this extension on Windows. Use of C, C++ extensions in the Swift runtime and libdispatch's use of blocks requires Clang. This results in multiple places where the compiler must be swapped out when building libraries during the Swift build process, something which CMake does not handle well. Symbolic debugging would help diagnose subtle bugs across a Swift standard library and the Swift runtime, but existing technologies are insufficient for this case. Type conformance validation for dynamic casting is implemented in Swift and called from the runtime. As there is no header with a shared declaration, the function signature must be replicated by hand. In doing so, the signature was written with the formal arguments in the Swift definition. Because the function is type generic, the compiler inserts an additional argument which provides the type metadata for the past formal argument, which is missed in the declaration. Due to the stack setup on Darwin and Linux, spilling the argument onto the stack at just the right location, the access happened to be correct. The procedure called specification on Windows X64 resulted in a different stack layout, and the compiler happily reused the argument register, resulting in an invalid parameter. Threading can introduce race conditions, which are challenging to isolate, because they may only happen occasionally. If they are not reduced down to a test case to verify that they have been truly resolved, they may disappear and return later. Swift uses a module at a time compilation, consuming all the source files at once. In order to ensure that the type metadata would be uniquely emitted, the compiler would home the function in the primary file. This is similar to how key functions operate in C++. If the primary file had not been emitted yet, the type metadata would be forward declared and given a combat association. Fortunately, the IR verifier in LVM caught this. Removing the comdat association caused the symbol to be strongly emitted and multiply defined. To compensate, the symbols needed to be marked as aliases for the definition in the primary file. The resulting object files could be linked fine with LLD, but now Link would object to the input, saying that the symbol we just emitted was missing. The IR in assembly looked correct, and LLD actually linked the binary. Why would Link be objecting? LLVM was incorrectly encoding the auxiliary symbol. It served as metadata for the linker to indicate that the symbol should be searched for in the libraries that we are linking against, rather than the object files for the current module. LLD would silently ignore this and implemented the behavior as if local search was requested. Link, however, was honoring the request and failing to find the symbol. 
This required fixing both sides, LLVM and Swift, in order to get correct behavior with, with both linkers. The extensive use of advanced features in the Swift's code generation helped expose subtle issues in the LLVM backend. The port to Windows continues to be an exercise in working with limited debugging support. PDB support was still maturing in LLVM while this work was ongoing. At the time, PDBs being generated by LLVM did not contain sufficient information to properly debug C++ code. Additionally, the need for extensions to support Swift required us to switch between CL and Clang. This made symbolic debugging nearly impossible and usually resulted in disassembly and printf debugging. The support for code view generation in Swift is still also nascent, so similar problems exist for debugging the Swift standard library and programs built with the Swift compiler. Even for the C++ code built with CL, we would often cross language boundaries, which would yield the Windows debuggers ineffective as they could not understand the different calling convention and would therefore be unable to reconstruct the stack. To complicate matters further, the Swift debugging model involves the debugger loading a serialized AST to query information about the source rather than emitting information which the debugger can readily access. In the lucky cases, assertions and traps would help identify the region of the binary where the failure occurred. In other cases, we had no choice but to start inspecting the assembly and try to reconstruct the state manually. The code generation tests are amongst the most valuable tests. They allow you to validate the compiler output and inspect the behavior in many cases to give some level of assurance as to whether the right content is being generated. These tests helped ease the port by permitting early testing on Linux. The test suite for Swift, like the LVM project, is executed through the lit tool. These tests are designed with Unix in mind, using all the extremely helpful tools that we take for granted. Compare, diff, touch, grep. LLVM realized this and implemented the built-in shell, which intercepts and emulates most of the required behavior, although usage in Swift went beyond the built-in version. The combination of the shell interpreter in lit and the tools from the Windows port of git provided enough of the necessary substrate to execute the test suite. Unfortunately, this alone doesn't solve the problem. Paths on Unix are usually unbounded, or near enough to not matter. Win32 paths are limited to 260 characters. Yes, 260, a story for another time. Many of the tools in lit, as well as the substitutions, needed to be adjusted to use NT-style paths, which loosened the restriction. To prove that this port was more than a proof of concept and maintainable long term, we need to be able to replicate the build. Being able to quickly identify changes which regress the build is extremely useful. Microsoft's Azure Pipeline service enabled us to build continuously with VS 2017, 2019, and Clang. Over time, this has been improved to enable pre-commit testing for higher reliability while iterating quickly. The Azure service gave access to Windows hosts, enabling running the test suite on Windows. The full test suite, with the exception of Darwin or Objective-C specific tests, now pass on Windows. The monolithic nature. The monolithic nature of Swift build complicated the port. By taking inspiration from LLVM and making the project more granular, it became possible to focus efforts on individual components. No longer do we need to build a compiler to iterate on the standard library. The components also trickled to application developers, who could now download just the runtime for redistribution with their applications. To demonstrate the current state of the Windows Swift support and to enable testing the bridging and code generation aspects of the Swift toolchain, I implemented a Swift-friendly interface to the Windows GDI API. This not only demonstrates the completeness of the toolchain and libraries, but the interoperability achieved with this port. Swift's ability to ingest and bridge the existing corpus of libraries enables it to provide full access to the Win32 APIs with the convenience of Swift you can easily use Swift to write a native GUI application. Most modern languages focus on immediate feedback. JavaScript prides itself on being able to empower users to write a snippet in a browser and immediately see results. This idea is not new, though. Many languages provide a read-evaluate print loop. The Swift project has a REPL through an execution mode for LLDB, but it still needs more work to be production-ready. 
and until recently did not function on Windows. As an internship project, Sasha Krasowski implemented a standalone Swift REPL using LLVM's ORCJIT, which runs on Windows and should, be, and should be easily be portable to other platforms. The REPL can bridge existing code in Swift Win like Swift Win 32, allowing rapid prototyping on Windows, enabling users to not only experiment with Swift code, but also the UI. This port has clearly matured, and a community effort around this is budding. But there are plenty of opportunities for others to get involved and improve it further. There are concrete approaches for simplifying the fragmented platform and Swift SDK setup to ease cross compilation. Although there is basic support to emit code view from Swift, this needs further refinement. Improving LLDB on Windows would make debugging more approachable. There is a vibrant, growing ecosystem of Swift software, which needs to be tested and built against new platforms. All of these are excellent opportunities to get involved. Finally, I would like to thank the many Swift engineers who provided invaluable help throughout the journey, to whom I am deeply grateful, and sorry to the many I have missed in this incomplete list. And thank you for your attention. I hope that this has been an entertaining peek into a few of the challenging aspects of this port.